We'll call to order this work session agenda briefing for the Board of County Commissioners for Thursday, October 20th to order. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. Mr. Administrator, uh, good morning, take us away. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. We do have a full agenda this morning. Um, the first part of the agenda will be, uh, you know, emceed by Dr. Cynthia Johnson. She has a couple items up here. So uh, come on up and, uh, and we'll get on to the incubator project. Then she's gonna do some introductions to new staff and talk about and give you an update regarding our small business enterprise um, program. Good morning, commissioners. Never thought I was gonna be an MC, but it's, you know, next time I'm gonna have, to have she, some music she, She's there, actually pretty I... good at that, so. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, I'm Cynthia Johnson, Director of Economic Development. Thank you all for the opportunity to give an update on the ARC Innovation Center, our new incubator. As you all are aware, this is a collaboration between the EDA, Pinellas County, and the City of St. Petersburg. Now, our partners in this collaboration is our operator, the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, and Tanya Elmore is here this morning uh, to support the project. ARC Invest, who sponsored the naming rights of the building, and will have their research team uh, listed as one of the anchor tenants in the building. Some of our other partners also include Beck. As you can see that beautiful picture in front of you, Beck was the architects that made the design for the building and Bandis Construction is our GC. They are doing a fabulous job in keeping us on time and within budget so far. <laughs> so we'll see how that ends up. But um, so what we are going to do is before I just give you a very brief overview, I did want to just take a point of privilege and just acknowledge and thank the internal county partners that we work with. Um, Jewel, your team is awesome. Um, we've worked with the, you know, the um, County Attorney's Office, OMB, RISC, um, um, Administrative Services, and many others. But those particular four entities have been critical in making this happen. So I'll move to the next slide. This is our project timeline. Our staff began this project in 2017 after Hurricane Irma. And after Hurricane Irma, the EDA was looking for a recovery and resilient investment priorities for communities that were impacted. And so at that time, we believe by focusing on how can we organically grow our entrepreneurial base and our innovation base, and we've, we believe that Pinellas County will be a perfect fit to uh, apply for this grant. And so we did, and we identified the St. Petersburg Innovation District as being the perfect community for this uh, particular project. And so, as noted on the slides, um, here are a few milestones. We submitted the proposal in 2018. We were awarded the grant in 2019. We worked with our partners at the City of St. Petersburg in 2019 to transfer the land over. And then we began the project in 2021. And together, all of you, most of you were there to celebrate our 2022 20, uh, this year, February the 15th, of our ceremonial groundbreaking of the project. If you have not been by the building, it is continually to grow up, go, go up, and I can't wait to have the topping off event. We're all just waiting for the topping to, to occur, but we continue to build. And we are currently on target to meet our 2023 July completion date for the construction. This economic investment does have specific industry focuses as noted on the slide. And this is part of our agreement with the EDA. And so I assure you that our team in TBIC has been working uh, to make sure that we have the right partnerships and the right programming, not only for the current tenants that Tanya have at the TBIC, but we're programming for the tenants that we will have in the future. TBIC is working with regional partners to strategically design programming, 
resources, and um, partnerships that include mentors, it include investors to support the new tenants of the incubator. One of the partnerships I wanted to highlight was Creative Pinellas. Tanya and her team is working with Creative Pinellas to identify a local artist for the mural that would be on the outside of the cafe. So we thought that was a really nice way to get the community involved and engaged. And um, we're not waiting for the building to be built for us to start putting programming in place for the incubator. Most recently, Tanya and her team launched a, what we call a climate tech acceleration program, and it's partnered with Duke Energy, Pods, and ARC Invest. They are our corporate champions for this project. One of the things we were very intentional about with the programming for the ARC Innovation Center is to engage our business community as well as our philanthropic community, as well as our professional community for the mentors for the building. So this climate tech program that Tanya has designed, and we will move it into ARC when the building is ready, is a 12-week accelerator program. And it really does demonstrate the cutting edge kind of programming we anticipate on having at this building. This type of program will support smart growth and development for early stage venture uh, firms. Our future tenants will be able to innovate and deliver new technology projects, not only to our community, but to the region and globally. This incubator project is definitely part of our overall economic development goals. It is our intent to make this incubator part of the epicenter of innovation. We really are looking to make uh, an impact of having a center that individuals want to invest in and support a community where people want to live. So that's my quick overview of where we are. What I would invite each of you to do that if you're in St. Petersburg going through the innovation district, please stop by because the picture I have up here does it no justice. Um, I turned this in, I guess, a month ago for, for today's presentation, and I went to St. Pete last weekend. The building, it's, it's amazing what's happening. And the good news is, from Hurricane Ian, we didn't have a big impact. It kind of delayed a, a couple of things, but it didn't have any impact on the structure. So uh, in talking with Tim, who's our project manager, on the project, we still are lying to be on time for our deadline in July of 2023. So that's my quick overview to kind of give you guys an update of where we are, and I'll take any questions. Questions? Commissioner Seal? There we go. Well, congratulations. Um, so how, where are we with getting the legal agreement finished up? Our, the legal team has completed the final draft of the agreement. The agreement is now with our operator. They are reviewing the agreement. Once it gets reviewed by the operator, then that the operator and my team will get together along with legal, do a final review, submit it to EDA for their review, and then we will be ready for the master lease agreement. And we're anticipating that that can be done within the next 30 days. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. And then how about um, outside of uh, investors other than NARC Investment? How are we doing with that? I see Tanya is here today. Tanya, you could come up if you like. But Tanya has been doing a fabulous job in getting the interest there. And so we have uh, quite a few investors who are ready to invest in the project. As you all know, part of TBIC's responsibility of being our operator is to... Um, to uh, get 1.5 million towards the FF&E. And last we spoke, Tanya's doing very well on re reaching that goal, but I'll let her address that. I would say to date, based on our current commitments, we're 50% there. Um, we were waiting to get the agreement before we proceeded on some of it, to be quite frankly with you, frank with you. Um, but yes, so we were halfway there, and I think we'll hopefully surpass that goal, So that, and then we can really gear up on the team when we move into the facility as well. 
Um, more recently, we even had more national venture capitalist uh, interest, especially in our climate tech initiative. Um, so we're definitely getting the spotlight on Pinellas County, and we're very happy about that. Great. Thank you very much. And I hope the agreement gets here on November 15th. <laughs> My last meeting. Commit. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> well, um, I just Pressure wanted to make up. one additional comment, and that is uh, this project is not just a local project. This project has gotten national attention. It has gotten um, the interest of not only um, local investors, international investors are contacting our office because they're reading about uh, this project. And as uh, we see our city partners in St. Pete develop the innovation district, I think the buzz is just gonna get, keep growing and growing. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to each of you for entrusting our department to do the due diligence and uh, look for opportunities for our citizens. And I think this is gonna be a great one. Commissioner Eggers has a question. Thank you uh, for the uh, short update. Um, and Tanya, I was going to ask Tanya to come up and just share a little bit what you just talked about, which is that national interest in the project, the buzz that should be building. I know we're a year, we're a year out. Uh, just curious what kind of, and thank you, by the way, for taking the time that you do to kind of go over with me every three or four weeks what's going on. I appreciate your patience. But maybe the kinds of tenants that are starting to express interest and the kinds of industries that you're you're hearing about um, at this early stage? Sure, and currently on our waiting list is a, um, a very well-branded company who wants to you know, kind of put an innovation arm uh, in there, and I don't have it in writing yet, so I don't feel comfortable sharing the name. Um, but just having 10 of their individuals from a national company located in there in the innovation side of that large corporation is one of the global companies that would have a presence there. Uh, we've been contacted by organizations in Silicon Valley as well. Um, as we know, we've all seen quite a migration um, to Florida during the pandemic, and I, a lot of that's continuing on. Most recently, you may have read the Business Journal article where Kathy Wood was at um, USF presenting to the finance department there and the students there, and made it very clear that she wants this region to be the focal point for innovation in, for the state of Florida, period. Um, so working arm in arm with ARC and their team to make sure that happens uh, will continue, and then bringing more national global exposure. I have a group coming in from the UK, and we have contacts calling us from Israel and Brazil. So there is a large impact um, globally. We just want to make sure they're the right fit for our community and that we can um, bring in the, the best uh, companies into our region as well and really build on some of those corporate partnerships in the making today. Um, our next initiative, right now we're working on uh, climate tech. Our next initiative will probably be around health technologies. So that we'll be building those brands as well. Well, that's exciting, and certainly reaching out to our universities and letting them know what we're up to is, is great. Uh, I've said this before, but a few economists have always talked about this Tampa Bay region as probably one of the uh, stars in the country in terms of um, helping people in, out of recessions or out of economic difficulties. We just got, there's so much power and energy here. This kind of effort that we're talking about, I think, only adds to it. and. Really excited about it, and I wish you continued success, Tanya, in your in your efforts and keep keeping us up to date. So, well, I also want to thank um, the commission for their support on the project as well. I mean, it's a large undertaking, on behalf of the county team as well, and all the work that and hours they've put in and to make this a reality. We're very excited about uh, continuing the partnership uh, and moving forward to the opening in October, hopefully. So, okay. look forward to that. Thank you. Further questions, comments on the this part of it? All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite, do I keep going or does it get changed? Um, okay. I'm going to invite Corey McCaster to join me for this presentation. <clears throat> I would like to introduce Corey to some of you and um, Many of you already know Corey. 
Corey McCaster is our new division director for the Office of Small Business and Supplier Diversity. His office manages the SBE program, and Corey comes to us with over 10 years of economic development experience, and he's stolen from Hillsborough County, <laughs> and he worked in economic development in Hillsborough County, and he specifically focused on min minority and small business development and has a strong financial background. So Corey's going to do the presentation regarding our small business enterprise program that you all uh, have implemented here at the county. Um, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Corey McCaster. Um, I am the director of the Office of Small Business and Supplier Diversity. I'm excited this morning uh, to share with you uh, the performance for the Small Business Enterprise Program. But before I get into the actual numbers and, 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 and the actual presentation, I want to stop and say that the fact that we took the time as a county uh, to actually implement the Small Business Enterprise Program, it couldn't have came at, the, at, the, I mean, at a better time, um, given that uh, with the redevelopment in the area, given the construction that was going on, uh, it gave the opportunity to companies uh, to be able to act on our commitment uh, to making an environment that's conducive to small businesses doing more business with Pinellas County. And so we're really excited uh, as, as we go forward to continue uh, to, to have that environment where small businesses feel like they can access uh, contracts with Pinellas County. Um, and we also have a, a partnership with individuals within the county um, that we feel uh, is uh, you know, it's exciting, uh, given that uh, those uh, individuals in the county have been working with us uh, to grow uh, the program for uh, the last three years. Uh, we are most excited about how the growth of the relationships with our internal partners and stakeholders. Each year, more county departments have supported the SBE program. And they've done that by uh, considering SBE vendors uh, when they're making purchases, including SBEs and project announcements. Uh, they also participated in the county's annual reverse trade show. And also, uh, they were also a part of our matchmaking events. So our internal departments and partners are really uh, you know, con contributing to the program, and we really embrace those, those, uh, those relationships. And we look forward to continuing those re relationships going forward. Uh, as, as the compiling of the 2022 financial performance data nears the end, I'm excited to say that the program continues to produce favorable outcomes for the third consecutive year. As you can see on the, on the board there, uh, there are some, um, some actual performance uh, uh, milestones and measures, uh, and I'll just go through some of those. Again, uh, we've exceeded the goal for the number of registered SBEs for the program. Um, the outcome uh, or the outcome for that measure was 119 percent above uh, above goal. As you can see on the the second block there, where we start talking about the SBE awards and prime contractors, last year we had 73 SBEs awarded prime contracts. This year we're up to 93. Uh, that is a 30 percent increase, and we're ecstatic about that. Uh, the number of contracts also went up 28 percent. Uh, over last year, uh, we had 232 uh, contracts last year for SBEs. Uh, this year is 297. Uh, payments with, uh, with prime contracts or for prime, from prime contractors to SBEs uh, are, are currently at 11 million points, I mean, $11.6 million. Uh, the number of out, yes. Microphone. Uh, on the 297 contracts uh, for 24.4 million, what is, how does that translate down to 11.6 million in payments? Is that just what's in progress? Absolutely. So the one is an award. So the, the 24.4 are the actual awards, but it takes time for those awards to turn into actual payments. Okay. Uh, and so it, it could be a company is awarded this year a, a, a five-year contract worth $10 million, but they won't realize all of that money in one year. 
Thank you. And commissioners, part of the program that they do is they track because maybe you have subs on projects and things like that. Sure. Well, you may have substitutions with the company, and so they're tracking that through the payment to actually see what's actually delivered. Thank you. Um, and then the number of outreach events uh, for the program increased also 51%. Uh, with a 75% increase in attendance. And so we just feel like as the program is growing, we're gonna be able to reach out not only just internally, but also in the community to continue to push those numbers. The, the more we can you know, touch base with partners and, and businesses in the community, the, the more we're gonna see participation in the SBE program. And, and the team is really committed to that. Um, as coming on as the director for the program, one of the things that I wanted to know and to have in my uh, back pocket at all times and so I began to track it as I came here, is the average SBE goal on project. And as you can see there, it's 11.6%. And, and we really uh, are happy about that because on, on average, if we're looking around an industry, it could be around 10%. And 11.6 is exciting to us, and we want to make sure that that continues also. Another question? Okay. Um, well, I'd like to see the attendees. That's, that's called believability. People are believing in the program, that's great. I think that's awesome. What's your sense of the number of, of these uh, awardees, the 93 SBE awardees, that are Pinellas-based employees versus kind Sorry, of- Sorry, I, I didn't hear your question. Told Pin, Pinellas-based, how many of them are Pinellas-based companies versus kind of a regional-based uh, companies? Uh, I don't have that information offhand for you, for you but I, I can definitely get that for you because um, we did not extrapolate that for this particular uh, presentation. I mean, we're trying to help small businesses throughout the region, so it's not necessarily proprietary, but, uh, you know, just trying to get a sense of it. Okay. One of the other things <clears throat> is our program has a regional criteria, and so we do have it based on uh, when they register if they're Pinellas, Hillsboro, uh, Manatee County, or Pasco County. That's our region for the program criteria. So we can uh, disaggregate that data and give that to you later. We do have that information, but just not for this presentation. Oh, thank you, and it's, it's, obviously it's important to, uh, to, to support not only our Pinellas County, but the region. Hopefully other counties will, will take leads on that and not, not create uh, uncomfortable a c competitive situation. I'm not talking about Hillsborough County either, uh, that uh, kind of doesn't allow that to happen. So I'm really, I'm glad to see that we're focusing on Pinellas County, but also the region. So and it's a you. regional database that they have that, that supports this. If you recall back in the design of the program, that was intentional on Cynthia's part because that way, you know, we're not all trying to like, you know, take out the bridges and you know, only only operate from within, and, and we really do work regionally because that's a, that's a benefit to our small businesses. If we do that, we don't we certainly don't want others that would impact our businesses either. So, um, but that is a design part of the program. But they do have the data to be able to break that down. And at the end of the day, it's about getting more people working, and so they can work here in Pinellas or you know work in Pasco or work in Hillsboro. It's all about better job, so that's great, great work. And it has really afforded us the opportunity to really diversify, diversify our supply chain to be able to have uh, that regional impact because as you all recall, as part of the development of this program, we had community conversations, we got the input from, from industry, and that was one of the things that they said to us as well is, hey, we wanna have opportunities across this region and we were a champion in making that happen. And then that, I think it was the second slide that had all of the uh, SBE partners. That's where that SBE collaborative came from because we not only give exposure to Pinellas County opportunities, everybody who's on that little collaborative, Hillsborough County, PSTA, Hart, they're all, we meet once a quarter with them and we expose our SBEs to their opportunities so that they can diversify their opportunities and not just focus on one um, portal for um, business, if you will. Thank you. All right. Um, this graph shows awards and, and payments uh, that were made um, over the, the last uh, four years of the, of the program, um, well, the last three years of the program. Um, the data that, this data is taken directly from OPUS and our B2G monitoring software. 
I call your attention to the physical years 2021 20, and 22. Uh, as you can see, the actual performance of the program as it relates to uh, the contracts uh, awards uh, has continued to increase. Uh, and, and then as you can also see, the payments increased also up, up until this year. Uh, you'll see that, that in 2022, the numbers are not as uh, high as they, they were last year. That's only because all the data has not come in as of yet. Uh, we're still waiting on data uh, to come in, and those numbers uh, are moving forward uh, as we get more data. Uh, at this point, uh, as of last night, I had the team um, run the, the numbers or, or pull some of the, the numbers last night, and the contract year-to-date awards uh, have adjusted up. Uh, this $28,370,000, and then the contract payments increased to $14,942,000, and that was as of last night. Um, the presentation was submitted back in August, so the numbers are still, are still coming in. And so we anticipate, fully anticipate, that the numbers uh, will surpass the payments as well as the contracts will outpace uh, last year's numbers. With that being said, um, even with the continuous increase of, in performance, uh, we still see opportunities to make the, the outcomes for the program even better. Um, an evaluation of the program data reveals a, a, a potential need for expedited payments for prime contractors with SBE goals. Um, the other is to increase participation in the annual reverse trade show. Departments who participate uh, in this reverse trade show tend to utilize SBEs uh, over the long haul more. Um, we also see promoting the new procurement platform um, it's important because SBEs usually don't migrate as quickly as others uh, to, to a new platform. And so we're working hard to make sure that all the SBEs are migrating into OpenGov. Um, also, we want to engage uh, the county units or departments that have a, a low annual SBE spend. And, and that's more to just make sure that they're aware of and, and to demonstrate uh, the abilities of SBEs and that they are fully capable of being able to uh, provide the work that the county wants. And so we've identified some, some departments we want to work with, and we're going to have uh, some, some conversations to try to identify ways to work together so that they can participate in the SBE um, spin and SBE program. The other thing that we have is we want to increase uh, the consideration among uh, county uh, PCAR holders. We want them to be able to, to utilize their P cards with SBEs um, as they go out and look to make purchases. We want them to, to consider an SBE, uh, make, make sure that they're in the fold uh, when they're spending money, uh, county money on a on P card. Uh, and then the other thing that we, we see that's important is that a financial training program that's focused on vendors, uh, sustainability, and performance, uh, just given the interest rate environments. We all know uh, that when interest rates start to rise, uh, it's the small business owners that get impacted the most, and we want to make sure that they have all of the understanding of how uh, to get the capital they need, um, how to, to, to actually organize uh, their finances within the business uh, you know, in, in a way that keeps them strong no matter what interest rates are, are, are doing. And so we look forward to having that uh, done as well. And this last slide that I have here is just an opportunity for us to really talk about some of uh, the, the actual businesses that are doing good things within the program, just some great success stories. Uh, RJP Enterprises exceeded all their go goals, uh, their SBE goals, and they did that at an 18.3 clip, which is uh, really, really good. They utilize, um, you know, utilize SBEs at 18.3% of the time, which is really good. And they also made payments of, of nearly $800,000 to SBEs. Manhattan Construction Group, um, here is one where they were not mandated to actually have uh, a SBE spend, but because of our relationships and, and partnerships and, and their understanding of, uh, the, of the program and the need to have SBE participation in the area, uh, they took on the challenge of having SBEs on their, on their projects, and they were able to pay SBEs um, $653,000. Uh, for participation on their, uh, on their projects, on their local projects. On the other side, you see, uh, we have uh, some SBEs that are operating as primes, uh, meaning that these are 
uh, are, are small businesses, but they're doing big things in Pinellas County. Uh, we got Bayshore Construction. Uh, they were awarded a $5.9 million uh, contract, which is really awesome. Um, Suncoast uh, Development, which is also an SBE, but they're operating as a prime. They have a 19-year, I mean, $19 million contract over five years, uh, which is, is another uh, great thing for an SBE. And then we have Evelyn Brothers, and they were awarded a, a portal gate contract, which totaled $854,298. And so we have primes, well, we have uh, SBE contractors or we have SBEs that are out there that can really do, uh, do the work that the county needs. And we want to continue to grow the program to bring in more SBEs and to demonstrate their ability uh, to get the work done. And with that being said, I will open up to any questions, any further questions. Questions for Mr. McCaster or Dr. Johnson? Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. We appreciate it this morning. Thank you. Next up, commissioners, um, I'd like to introduce, if you haven't met yet, uh, Kevin McAndrew. Um, so Kevin is our fairly new build, uh, Director of Building and Development Review Services. So what he's going to provide you is an update on our ongoing <laughs> um, improvement process for our Building um, and Development Review Services. They've been doing a lot. Um, but it is a very complex, very regulated area that has cross-departmental issues. Um, and so we've made improvements, but we're not where, anywhere where we need to be. Um, and, and he's going to outline kind of what we've done, where we're going. Um, but he also brings a, a real level of understanding, specifically around stormwater. He's a certified floodplain manager. And, and, and that background has actually been very helpful because those cross-departmental issues are the ones that can get very complex, very technical, um, and cause large delays. And so um, he's still new, so we're still um, wanting to see the outcome, <laughs> but, but he certainly have, has brought some creativity try, trying to solve issues. And that, I think, is the single biggest um, thing that we need to improve upon, both from a contractor standpoint and from a county standpoint and trying to solve issues. So I'll turn it over to Kevin um, and uh, get here an update. Thank you, Barry, and good morning, commissioners, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you what I believe is a very timely update. Uh, as Barry mentioned- Recording I, in progress. As, uh -oh. as, Barry, as Barry had uh, alluded to, I have a brief slide deck um, I'm going to first give a quick snapshot of the chronology of the program, where we are, what's in progress. But I'm going to look to focus the greater extent of my presentation to you on where we will get to in the next five to six uh, months. I've been on board as director for almost five months. Again, as Barry had referenced, then um, I have no hesitation in expressing that I've been extremely fortunate to join the county at a time when there's been a significant investment made and there is the foundation and the initial implementation steps of this far-reaching program in place. And um, as, uh, it's okay. as, uh, as, my, as my role as, um, as director, it's my responsibility to leverage the existing momentum set in place and, and deliver the return on investment uh, that, has been, that has been made. I'm really high on what BDRS can and will deliver. You're looking at a snapshot of, um, of the chronology of this program, the first phase from 2019 uh, through 2021 was building that foundation. This is typical with any successful plan you need to go through an existing conditions assessment. You need to understand where there's opportunities, develop those strategies, and move them forward. That's what happened in the first phase. Phase two um, um, brought forth the first implementation steps uh, of the program, and, and that included the adoption of, of new code flexibilities and the piloting of the project management program, which is really one of the key pieces of this overall initiative. And I, and I want to just take a moment to share with you that the project management program has immediately revealed 
some, some early wins and the potential that it's going to deliver. The first uh, redevelopment project under the form-based code in Palm Harbor uh, was recently approved, uh, the All Care project, um, the Tesla redevelopment project of former Keynes Furniture uh, Warehouse uh, was approved. This is an example on a project uh, where the review cycles were reduced. There was an early uh, release construction permit issued and uh, unsolicited, we've gotten feedback. I, hopefully it's been shared with you that uh, uh, the, the builder and developer on this project has expressed uh, their interest in reinvesting on new projects within, within the county. On the flexibility side, this is a, this is a real valuable uh, tool because while there's been uh, a host of, of flexibilities that have been exercised, they generally have been categorized within setbacks, within fences, within some code interpretation. And by tracking these flexibilities, what it's able to do is, is reveal to us whether the flexibilities are effective or, or ineffective. And in fact, we are seeing some flexibilities that were adopted that really haven't been very effective. And so this is telling us that we need to go back. We, we either need to change those flexibilities or we need to change the code. Um, and I'll speak to that um, a little bit further. Um, phase three, this is where we are today. Uh, this is where we're going. I'm going to really focus on this over the next uh, series of slides. You're looking at, um, on this slide here, what was reported to you in February of 2022. Uh, there's a suite of initiatives under the four strategic areas of customer experience, technology, operations, and organizational change. What I'm gonna do on the next series of slides is selectively highlight and feature what we think are the most meaningful uh, initiatives that you'll see come to, to fruition. Often the first experience we have with any organization is that frustrating experience when you go into the abyss of a, of a, of a, of a phone answering system and, and you get lost, you don't even want to do business with an entity. This is one of our key initiatives um, and to give you kind of just a little snapshot, it's pretty compelling. Just in the month of August, which is representative, there's over 9,000 calls that come into BDRS. And that doesn't include the direct calls that would go to any of our staff that have relationships uh, with the development community. Um, that's a lot of volume. Um, and today, the system that in, that's in place is antiquated. It's what we would all wide and deep, there's many phone numbers uh, that, that end in voicemails that are dead ends. Um, so there's been, a, I believe, really a very progressive approach to solving this, and it's data-driven. It's, it's, it, there was a lot of analysis to understand what are the top four reasons why our customers call. And, and what we've done going forward, which is really a bold move is that there'll be one phone number for BDRS and after a short um, initial automated message, the customer will be able to go into each of those four options or those four buckets where they will be staffed with the skill sets to assist our customers for, for those areas that again are, are most frequently uh, or reached out to inspections, permitting, zoning, and if there's others, um, those will be staffed again with our call center uh, specialist to be able to assist in directing, uh, in directing the customers. The, the concept here is to get the customer in the most efficient base to a live, in-person staff member skilled to be able to help them right up front. Front and center, um, as it should be, um, is, is the issue of uh, technology. Technology bringing efficiencies, technology um, enhancing the customer experience. 
and technology also enhancing our quality control within our operations. Uh, going live, I know most of you have heard um, about this initiative going live on December 5th is what we call ePermit Hub. This is all electronic filing and coordinated electronic review. I could spend an hour just on this initiative. I don't want to get the hook while I'm up here. So um, I can tell you there are far-reaching benefits with this, uh, with this technology. Um, it's, this will be a game changer. Uh, it just covers, like I said, everything from efficiencies to quality control. Uh, we're really excited about it. We're currently in what's called um, testing UAT mode right now. We're transitioning into full training mode um, for, our, um, for our customers as well as staff. There is a comprehensive marketing strategy right now that's being um, implemented um, to inform through different media, through, through emails, through card racks, through, through um, signatures, on, like I mentioned, on, on our emails, uh, through our website. So we are getting the word out. There's going to be tutorials available to our customer base. Um, we're going to have kiosks. We're, we're putting a full-out campaign to make this transition uh, to this technology as seamless as we can. And, and equally exciting, following um, ePermit Hub, in early next year is another technology, uh, which is virtual inspections. Uh, Commissioner Gerard has a question for you. I just have a question about the permits. Um, so when this is implemented, people will be able to go online and see what the status of their permit is, or is That's, that down the road? That is, that is correct. Okay. That is correct. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the pieces of, of this that, you know, was happening so linear um, is that permits were moving from one division to another division. You know, through ePermit Hub, we're looking to have reviews, and they will occur, all, all simultaneous. And once the comments are actually posted, they will be available through the public-facing side of the technology. Getting back to virtual, te virtual inspections, this is another game changer. Um, it's being used in Pasco, it's being used in Bavard County. Um, we're gonna roll it out, as I think we should do, in a prudent fashion, where it's first going to be aligned with our express permits. Uh, so these will be the more simpler uh, permits that are, are issued the same day. Uh, but here, we, here we're gonna recognize the ability to consolidate um, inspections bring a degree of uh, enhanced customer service um, where this can happen, like I said, a contractor remote on site, working with uh, our staff in the office, to savings on travel time. Um, so we, we just see this, this particular technology expanding from the first phase. We also see it um, also expanding well beyond just building. The opportunity to use this within our divisions within um, environmental, on habitat, erosion control inspections, on engineer, simple engineering inspections. So we're looking to really bring this um, and, and expand it as much as we can. You know, I'm going to go off script for a moment, which is always, yes. Commissioner Agris. No, just uh, in, on these inspections, uh, it'll be the same as tracking permits too. So when calling for an inspection and knowing when and when they're going to be out to do it, or if they have to come out and do it, or can they do it, you know, virtually? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. You know, as I'm as I'm taking you through what I really believe are very compelling initiatives that'll be coming online, I, I'm going to just go off script for a, a moment, which um, has to do with the conversation I had with Commissioner Eggers. This is a conversation that Barry has um, has has raised with me numerous times. I've heard it from from Tom Almonte. You know. And I've, and I've been preaching this to staff from day one, and I know this from the private sector for over 30 years. We could do triple backflips rolling out these initiatives seamlessly, and if we don't return phone calls, and if we don't answer emails, it's all going to get defeated. You know, it's all going to be dismissed. And it is, you know, what I've been preaching to anyone in our department is, it's not necessarily working harder, it's working smarter. 
All we have to do is carve this into our daily routine, and it's going to go a long way. We don't have to have every answer. Make the return phone call. Get the email back. That takes the frustration and the stress away from our customer base. It's just not that difficult. So I want to make sure that this is, this is not a fancy initiative. This is just simple um, communication uh, that, that we're building into our, our culture. The project management side um, is, is really a huge piece of all of the initiatives. And I think just as it was envisioned from the outset of this continuous improvement program, it's woven and integrated into all of these initiatives, from technology to customer service, of course, up front and, and operations. Um, key to the success of project management is having the resources, thank you to the commission for approving um, last year's budget. We're going to, we have four in place. We're going to have another project manager coming online, if not in October, um, in November. Um, and it's really exciting to see the expansion of project management into so many areas. They're listed up there. I'm not going to go through all of them. But um, it's, it's, it's going to go way beyond, you know, today, the piloting. It's going to handle all site plans, just as an example. Um, and the project managers will be the facilitators to get to yes. They're not the technical experts, but they are the facilitators to get to yes. And probably one of the most important observations that I have now witnessed over the past couple months is buy-in from our staff as to the value of project management, both to the customer as well as internally for our own staff. Operational and regulatory changes. Um, you know, I've had the benefit of uh, representing the development community, as Barry had alluded to, for, for over 30 years. I previously came from the city of Sarasota, where I was entrenched in development there as general manager of development services. And um, I did have the opportunity on joining the team here to pretty quickly identify some additional opportunities and, and changes that could be integrated um, into, uh, into all of these, these initiatives. And you know, probably one of our most common criticisms besides responsiveness is why is it so complex and how can I find out how long something is going to take? So these were two areas of focus that I'm pretty, pretty excited about some of the changes that you're going to see take place to simplify the process and to bring predictability uh, to the process. So just a couple examples of that is that um, the, the development review committee process is going to be recalibrated. This will go live in January. Um, there will be defined certain dates that when a site plan comes in and it's processed, the day it's filed and deemed complete, the applicant is going to know when they're going to get their comments and when they're scheduled for either a public meeting or the next technical review. This will be the case, and we're going to expand these defined review periods right through building permits um, as, we, as we go forward. It's going to start with site plans in the DRC. Um, we're also looking to empower staff. The project managers going forward are going to chair the DRCs. The technical staff that review the site plans, they're going to be sitting with the DRC. So they're going to be front and center working with the applicants. This is all part of our um, initiative going forward. Um, you know, one of the, the, the examples that um, we see a lot is the smaller land development projects stifled um, and, and through, through arduous uh, processes of site plan and subdivision. The perfect example are a couple of Habitat for Humanity projects in Ridgecrest uh, where there are three lots. Uh, they're subject to going through both site plan and subdivision. We're going to have code changes that will be brought to you early next year that will address this. 
and it's intended to, to benefit the, the, the entire development community, particularly on the smaller projects. We're going to increase the thresholds of the development that requires site plan. We're going to also provide a provision that when you're on an approved street with utilities, it doesn't need to go through subdivision. We're able to, we're able to approve that through a simple lot split and allow those projects to go right to building permit. This is all about simplification and predictability. And one of the things we're going to be doing going forward is I mentioned this first batch of LDC updates being brought to you in, uh, early in the year. We're going to be looking to do this on a regular annual basis. If we need to come back to you on a biannual basis, we'll do it. But we're going to be tracking uh, potential code updates and flexibilities continuously and looking to bring these to you, as I mentioned, on a, on a, on a regular basis. Um, I want to um, also just briefly highlight what's up there as BDRS division efficiencies. This is a culture change. This is staff self-initiated um, changes that there is an understanding that continuous improvement doesn't end when these initiatives go live. That continuous improvement goes beyond February and March of next year. The staff um, have, as I said, on a self-initiated basis, have put forth some really neat ideas um, as far as bringing additional efficiencies on cross-training, consolidations of inspections. Um, the staff has embraced the concept of having on-call third-party uh, resources that if we get to a scenario where we don't have the resources to maintain the efficiencies that we need, we can call on that outside firm or those firms to come in and help us get, get through that gap and, and keep that efficiency uh, moving forward. When it comes to organizational changes, it was my assessment uh, that our organization was really narrow and vertical. And if you were somewhere um, not near the top, it was a long way to get to the top. We've, we've restructured our organization in BDRS where responsibility has been distributed to a much more horizontal structure with each of these four, uh, four groups reporting directly to myself as the director. There's clear lines uh, now with our organization chart. Uh, there is also clear delineation between a very complementary skill set between myself and the deputy director, Michelle Krikovic. So we're really pleased with where our organizational structure is uh, with, with roles and responsibilities being clear and really tying into what is also on this slide. The idea of retention, recruitment, morale, all of this drives productivity. Uh, quite frankly, BDRS is behind. We know there's other departments in the county uh, that have both career paths and career ladders in place. We don't. This is a priority for us uh, next year because turnover uh, and recruitment, we know how difficult it is um, in, this, in this marketplace. This is a summary um, snapshot. The point of this um, is not to go through these with you. It's, it's to, to give you just a, an overview of the totality of what BDRS has on our plate right now. We have a lot going on, and, and probably most important here within, and within these four areas, strategic areas, customer experience, technology, operations, is that time chart. What's in yellow? is in progress or in development. What's in green is go live. And you can see the set of initiatives here. By February, all of these will be in place and moving forward. You know, I'd spoken a little bit about um, continuous improvement doesn't end with these initiatives, changing the culture. All of those, all of those areas up there, I'm confident are, are, are being embraced and moving forward. Um, importantly, BDRS is aligned with the county's vision. You know, I've, I've rattled off a lot here in a compressed period of time. Um, I've 
probably shortchanged some of the value of these initiatives, but um, again, I want to make sure that there's, there's ample time uh, to answer any questions, but um, I'd like to conclude really where I started, um, and that is, yes, there's, there's plenty of more work to do, uh, but I'm confident that uh, BDRS, with responsiveness, uh, bringing predictability, uh, bringing flexibility, we can get to yes. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the update. Um, and this, the things that you're talking about um, are music to the development community's ears and, frankly, mine as well. Um, this is all really good stuff. And I, when you, you, you slowly said in the next five to six, and I'm thinking, don't say years, and you said months, which was great. Uh, <laughs> Because honestly, so many of us, we, you know, if we, the perfect scenario is we would never hear from the development community because you all are doing the, the job you need to, to do. And I, I, I really appreciate the direction you're going. You made comments about flexibility, changing, uh, flexibility and changing codes and bringing to them as you see fit. Please do that because, it, you know, we can't improve unless we ad address some of those code changes to allow your people to have a little more, um, you know, hands-on kind of direction uh, each day. Uh, you talked about the calling, and I think handling those calls in and calls out to people are like you're probably one of the most important things that we do. And I, if you can pass that along, and just from people that I talk to on the outside, they have no idea what's going on inside this this box here. So to be able to communicate that, just a simple call to say, I don't have an answer for you yet. Hopefully in the next day or two I will, goes miles to giving somebody comfort and predictability. So I really appreciate the discussion about culture change. I appreciate the discussion about using technology the way we should probably have been using it for, so, uh, for, for longer periods of time. Um, so simplification, predictability, uh, code changes, um, system-wide implementation uh, initiatives. Uh, all of that, I think, is just great. Circling back to that county vision, quality of quality service, respectful engagement. That's so important. Um, it's so important for our for our business and our residential community. The folks that just like any of us sitting in this room are trying to get some things done. So. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Michelle's name. Michelle, I always think of you. I think of process and process management. And techno it's really important in all of this that we're doing. So um, I'm encouraged. I look forward to those changes, December and then early January and then ongoing stuff. Please keep communicating all of these things that we're about to, to, the, to the outside world. When it's coming, tell them it's coming. Uh, let them know what we're working on because I think they need to they need to be excited about these changes as well. So thank you for the update. Appreciate it, Mr. Burton. Yeah, and also, commissioners, you know, I had a meeting just a couple weeks ago with the Tampa Bay Builders Association, and, and that's one of the things we talked about is having ongoing dialogue with all the members. Certainly, we have the DRC, and and, and we get feedback there, but really having a broader conversation, um, and and working together. Sometimes, because sometimes, you know, it's, it's both sides where, where we need to talk, where we need to hear each other's perspective on issues. And so we're going to improve upon that too. I want to actually have Kevin, he doesn't know this yet, but present to them. Um, but, but I want to see the improvements before we send him out there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're going to give him an opportunity to make some of these changes, implement that, and then we're going to have that and, and we'll engage with their members and, and a broader audience. So I think that'll also yeah. be a, a real help to the way in which we move forward. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Kevin. And I hope you haven't been overwhelmed by this process you've been going through. Of all of the issues that I hear the most about when people want to complain about something regarding the county, it usually has to do with building and permitting. And th there seems to be um, a misunderstanding, and I'm, I won't use the right words because this isn't necessarily my wheelhouse, but they talk about how they come in, they meet with our building and permitting people, they walk away with a list of ch 
things you know that they have to complete and do and they do them in con consort with their architect or their engineer or contractor whoever they're working with and then they come back and then they're asked to do other things and this is a re repeated 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 scenario that can go on for a very very long time and it gets really very frustrating for the end person who's trying to get a building or development or whatever done now just yesterday and this probably isn't the right venue to bring this up in but i'll just try to be brief and hit the highlights we have a big developer who's trying to do an incredible thing it just so happens to be within the city of st petersburg however everything going on there impacts what happens here at the county on forward Pinellas and our people working at the county so in all of your continuous improvement things that you've listed there is there a piece of it that uh, tries to somehow fine-tune the issues that go on between the county and the city so the the piece of the initiative that um is really going to bring, I think, the greatest value is what we call early assistance. So if there is a project, whether it's in the unincorporated area or within one of the incorporated cities, but there is a connection to the county, whether it be on a county road, whether it be through stormwater, <coughs> early assistance is where project management is going to be able to assist in bringing clarity to what steps need to be take place what requirements have to be dealt with, and if there's conflicts, the intention is to have those conflicts identified as early as possible or challenges and to assist the customer before there's huge investments made on engineering plans, on architectural, architectural plans, et cetera, um, again, to, to streamline the process, process from that point going forward. So, and commissioners, most of the cities have their own codes, and so they go through that. It's only where there's a piece where it's both city and county. But what, what I wanted to comment on on that is that early assistance that Kevin talked about, we're not gonna require that because we've got, I, I've got a personal example of a, of a project where they didn't do early assistance and they're submitting stuff back and forth and it delays the project for a year if they would all sit down at the table, but we didn't require it. You know, that, you know I blame the developer on that one, but you know, I blame us, we, sh we should have forced that issue because then everybody's pointing fingers and it really doesn't matter at that point because the homeowner you know, is sitting there going, what in the heck is going on? And so I think just simple things like that, saying no, this has multi-disciplines, we're all coming to the table, simply helps on those things. Um, because it, you know, later, six months, eight months later, you know, everything gets fuzzy about who did what. And so things like that, I think, are gonna make a big difference on some of these projects. Yeah. And to further, to further that, um, when there is a site plan threshold met uh, that will need to go through DRC, pre-applications will be mandatory exactly to that point where an applicant is not going to, on a discretionary basis, say, oh, I don't need it, and then find themselves going through you know, additional cycles of review when it, when it isn't necessary. So we're looking to, to, to minimize those type of scenarios happening uh, that once you're into that site plan uh, process, you're gonna have a mandatory pre-application up front that should bring that, that clarity and value to the uh, customer. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. Well, I think all my questions have been answered, but I really appreciate what you're saying about um, getting to yes, you know, and that whole culture of what you can do rather than what you can't do. And, you know, helping people and being very transparent about the whole process and helping them through it. That's, I think that's gonna make all the difference. And as you know, I'm sure, doesn't take much to destroy the reputation of the whole department. You know, one project and everybody in town knows about it. So, uh, and then it sticks for years. County is so difficult to work with but I think you have the right idea and the right model in place that will be in place. So thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Flowers. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think I'm on. It's yeah, on. I'm on. Um, <clears throat> like has already been stated by so many others, I am appreciative of this moving forward, having conversations with Barry about um, just ways to expedite the process because time is money when you're talking development projects, especially for affordable projects um, because the uh, more you can keep them on track, um, the better it is for their bottom line to be able to have those units remain affordable once they're complete. Um, so I do appreciate that. Um, I may have missed it or maybe that's not a part of this, um, but I see uh, a lot of information that's going to make things easier and accessible, but what will be the process to make sure that contractors, developers, et cetera, understand how to upload their information for virtual review? Um, is there a specific um, program that they will need? Is it done just through Excel or Microsoft or whatever the case may be? Um, and will there be an opportunity for potential community training for them so that they know exactly how they upload it, where to go in, how to you know receive the response, how to respond to the response or whatever so that things continue to flow? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and such a key piece of, of making this transition um, successful. Yeah, there's a public facing portal today that is available to contractors and to everybody that provides you access to a seller. Um, it will be the same portal that will provide the ability to file and, and as will be required to file electronically. There will be on our website, as I mentioned, through a whole host of, of proactive marketing, there'll be tutorials, um, we are going to have temporary staff available in this initial transition period to assist likely, you know, the homeowner or a small contractor that may not be familiar. You know, the, the larger AE firms are, are already using this in other municipalities. Okay. But we understand that um, we need to have those resources on hand at the outset to assist um, and we'll, we'll, well, that's exactly what we're planning, and we have that um, going to be online. Okay. Um, and I think I may have asked this question before, um, but do we have, um, I'm going to say, an expedited process for projects that are affordable? We do have an expedited process. This may come uh, as a surprise to some of you, but we're looking to expedite all projects okay. going forward. And that's, that's part of the predictability side of having um, defined certain review periods and dates for all projects going forward. The other piece, again, I'll, I'll just quickly highlight that when I first came here, it didn't take me days, it took me weeks to wrap my head around all these iterations of, of, of site plans, walkthroughs, distributed, going forward, it's either a site plan or it's a building permit. And so we're gonna be, if you don't hit that threshold, you're in building permit, and there'll be the technical review for small land development projects will happen concurrent as part of the building permit review. So this is, this is also going to be a game changer, and it's through technology that's going to allow us what they call a digital plan review for all of our staff at the same time to see where each other are with these reviews and to facilitate this type of streamlined process. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Well, thank you so much. Um, I recently gave Barry, while I was cleaning up my files, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it was about that much. <laughs> Doesn't compare to what was in the, the office, but anyway, um, so because I chaired a committee looking at the permitting advisory committee kind of thing over 20 years ago, so this has been an institutional problem for years, and so um, I know Commissioner Latvala did another um, committee, and I believe um, Commissioner Eggers did at some point too, so our level of frustration is a bit um, hi, but it sounds like you are hitting a home run um, and really, really appreciate that.
So um, two questions. One is you mentioned that the project managers don't necessarily have a background. Um, what kind of backgrounds do they have? No background in well, construction or building permits? They do have, they do have um, a background in planning, zoning. Some of them do have a background in civil engineering. Okay. But the, the piece, the distinction here is that the project managers are the facilitators of issue resolution um, and that the expertise whether it's engineering, whether it's environmental, whether it's transportation related, those, those, that expertise needs to still lie with the staff that have those credentials. The, the project managers, as you rise from a PM1 to a PM2, clearly their qualifications are going to have them be able to understand the issues, but they're, they're on board to identify conflicts to identify gaps early in the process and work through issue resolution with the appropriate technical staff. Okay, so they're essentially ombudsmen's. Well, that's that's a piece of what that's a piece of what they're doing. Yes. Okay, and then the um, other and Commissioner Long, having brought up that particular project that I've also heard about as well. Um, that has somewhat to do with countywide um, land use and so on, but because of that and because of what you do, I'm thinking, are you gonna have some, kind of, some person who's the liaison between our planning department, because it almost is seamless when you think about it, and then forward tell us, because that might help to, um, also create a, a better process for people in general. I know it sounds kind of unusual, but. They're part of the early assistance, aren't they? What's that? Planning is part of the early assistance. How does that connect they, they, to Planning is part of the early assistance. I, I think, though, that the point that's being raised is something that um, is really relevant, um, and that is um, really enhancing the, the, the coordination you know, between BDRS, uh, between economic development. Uh, Dr. Johnson and I have initiated these discussions with forward Pinellas, with, with housing and community development. There's an opportunity here to really increase the degree, you know, you know break the silos and, and, you know, improve the coordination, you know, interdepartmentally. Um, this is going, this is, a di this is an active dialogue. This, this is one that um, there's a lot of opportunity to make improvement there. And, and Commissioner, to your point, we, we've, we've looked at do you, need, do you need all of the people that are in that review process to be under Kevin? Mm -hmm. Or can they reside in the department and you break down the silos to improve that flow? And, and that's an ongoing discussion. And I, and I don't think there's an outcome that we've determined yet. Um, I'm certainly open to any that will improve the process. Part of the problem is you have people that do, do, do certain duties that have other duties within the department. Mm -hmm. And so only part of their, their job is that permit review piece. And so it, it's a little complicated, but we're currently reviewing that. Well, I guess that's why I came up with this idea of, you know, could one person be the liaison or in an essence the ombudsman so that we do have more coordination with um, with Ford Punellas and with mm -hmm. our planning department. Just as an idea, mm -hmm. it might be one way to help to streamline it because honestly, when you think about what one person goes through here to be able to make land use changes or zoning changes, it gets to be so complicated. And that's only a, in, in so anyway. <laughs> a great, great, great feedback. Um, there's, like I said, there's a lot of opportunity there. Project management at the moment is our resource um, to, to be that coordination with housing and community development. Um, our um, PM uh, lead is on uh, one of the selection committees of economic development. So we're, we're looking to kind of cross-pollinate where we can um, to, to, to break down you know, these, these issues that have occurred in the past. Sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. And Welcome. Thank you again. And you know, I and I'd be very remiss because I got to walk back across the street um, by not acknowledging, which I think you all know, 
that the, the makeup of BDRS is incredibly talented and dedicated staff. Um, and, you know, through this investment, you know, that you've put forth, um, I'm really confident that we will get to where we need to be. But the, but the, the staffing, the talent is, is here and the dedication is here. This is, uh, this is a big tune-up, as they say. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Agris has one more before you go. Oh, thank you. About you know, you know, breaking the silos, having communi cross communication. I, I just can't. That's so important. And you know, it's like we talk about economic development, how how important it is. But if you can't do building development review service as well, then economic development is just out there. Sometimes they ha issuing false promises because we can't even deliver on getting a building done for these folks that are trying to trying to either stay here or, or, or attract new businesses. So I think that's great. I'm really excited about that piece of it. The other piece is this in transition. And I would you know, encourage you um, to continue reminding your employees that the, you know, we're on the move, so to speak. So I think the idea about talking to the Builders Association and letting them know that there is transition going on. There's going to be some change. Hang in there with us. But when we make a comment to you like, please come in and do some early assistance, it's a different day than it was when we said that before. You know what I'm saying? In other words, we are making changes, but if we, like, we suggest this, you know, please take us up on it and, and remember to be patient with our contractors and developers and such because we are going through this change and it will be for the better. And I just, I'm again, really excited about it. And then I would be remiss if I didn't say that you're leading the way and making callbacks. So you've done it with businesses that, that have called me. They said, oh, you got back to me that day. So thank you for that. And you get back to our office and Kim all the time so punctually. And I think that's something that your folks in your department, that culture change that you're talking about, it starts with you and you're already doing it. Uh, and I think it's important that they understand how big a deal that is. So thank you for that effort. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Before we move on, we're, let's take a five-minute recess.
back to order. We'll go ahead and start it with item number four. Mr. Administrator. Item number four, Commissioners, uh, is the issue of TBARDA funding. Um, we certainly have their, um, uh, their, the dues um, for 2023. Many of you are involved in those discussions and what's occurred with other counties, and so it's a simple question of whether or not you want us to pay the dues and continue to participate um, or not. And, and I, you know, I don't really have a staff recommendation on this because I really don't participate in that group. Um, you know, it, it, it's more done from a policy making level. How many other, I mean, of the members, so there's, there's, uh, is there four counties and then the, the cities, the two cities, is that correct? Five counties. I would, I would defer to your fellow commissioners. My, my question is how many, I, we've seen in the at least news occurrences that other counties are, or other entities are not going to be providing funding anymore. And so I was just curious, do we know um, what percentage they've lost in that kind of thing? Commissioner Long. In response to your question, they have received word from Hernando County that they are no longer participating. Um, the city of St. Pete, it's my understanding, is holding payment. I'm not sure if they're waiting to see what we're doing. Pasco is in the same boat uh, and inclined not to pay. Hillsborough County has been a very reluctant partner from the beginning in terms of moving forward and the city of Tampa has notified them that they were not going to pay. So, we don't really have... Tampa and Hillsborough? I'm sorry? Did you say Tampa and Hillsborough? We don't know about Hillsborough unless Commissioner Flowers has additional information, but I just spoke with David day before yesterday. And we have a board meeting on Friday to talk about dismantling the agency so that's what I know. But we have not received our funding requests from the state uh, four out of five times. And the agency has no planner and their, um, their communications guy has resigned, he's leaving in two weeks to take another job. So basically, they have David, they have uh, their finance director and their administrative assistant. And the uh, van pool, which uh, secretary, it belongs in the Florida Department of Transportation to make the decisions about where that goes. And there has been discussion about Pinellas County would pick PSTA would pick up the Pinellas piece of it, and Hillsborough County would do their Hillsborough piece. Ninety something percent of the people who use the van pool are from Hillsborough County. Manate oh, in Manatee, Manatee County. See, structurally, when it was re reconstituted in 16 and 17, it was almost dysfunctional in the way that they put the counties together that were part of it. And the reason was mostly political because Manatee County was part of Representative Galvano's district and Representative Galvano was poised to become president of the Senate. When they actually brought the bill before the legislature, it was time for Wilt Simpson to rise into the presidency so they worked out a deal and added Hernando. But in the planning district, the way it exists today, Hernando and Manatee aren't really part of it. And Manatee is part of district tra um, Transportation District 1. All of the rest of the counties are Transportation District 7. Questions, Commissioner Seal. So, um, Renee, thank you, Commissioner Flowers, thank you for sending us the email. So, under the statutory powers that they have 
from the legislature can anybody else do what they do or could it i mean it or would it take a legislative change at um, my understanding is the same counties that make up the uh, t barda also make up the regional planning council so they could do it if they had a transportation planner secondly the work that's being done could be done by our forward Pinellas um, and I don't because they retain the same powers according to Whit Blanton they now, can plan develop finance construct own purchase operate maintain I don't know about the public transportation projects and facilities I mean that was the biggest power that T Barta was given when it was initially established. I thank God we've never even had a conversation about that. Oh, that we did. A, Trust me, back when we were doing transportation referendums. Oh, well, <laughs> I was never part of those conversations. But um, the fact of the matter is, it's structurally set up to fail the way it is today. And the members that are on the board, in my opinion, I'm just giving you my opinion, are the wrong people because nine times out of ten we have to cancel our meetings because we don't even have a quorum. Well, I understand geographically. I mean, it would make more sense. Can you just get a little closer to the mic? Oh, sure. I, I always, I had mentioned this before, and I know the TMA is more of a um, Volunteer. informal group that has no powers but would it be better because the TMA consists of Hillsborough, Pasco and Pinellas to legislatively change it so it would have more powers um, that's one question the second was and we may not know the answer to this and Chris may have to look for it how much do we contribute now to the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council I mean they don't have the ability to operate and maintain Whatever we do will require some type of uh, legislative action. But the legislature has been trying to do away with T. Barter for the last three years, I think it is. And I actually tried to do away with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council some years well, ago. Senator Brandis was the person introducing the bill yeah. the first time. Microphone, please. Sorry. Oh, no. I thought what Commissioner Seal was asking was how much are we contributing to to um, the, the regional plan? Regional plan. Council. Yeah, we, not the state. We, we. the yeah. county. And you were, so she, yeah, she's trying to. Chris, are you looking that up? Because then I'm going to guess that they would want more money from us for the transportation aspect. Would it be better to look towards PSTA taking the responsibilities and Art. But PSTA is not positioned to do the things that they're not. PSTA is not a regional. No, PSTA. I know, but yeah. I mean, but trying to set up a working group. I mean, they already have the Transit Advisors Advisory Committee under T. Barta. Could they formalize that further and so that you would have some kind of regional approach? I don't know. I'm trying to think yeah. structurally yeah. how yeah. this could best work. But the main thing that you know, again, the statutory powers, I'm not sure anybody else other than maybe PSTA or HART could actually do um, what those statutory powers are under so, T-BARTA. So um, what, you're having a meeting when this week? Friday. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And on the agenda is the, the dissolution of the organization. The possibility, the possibility of. of. So. So we don't need to make a decision today, writing, uh, you know, as far as sending them a check. If you would rather us put it on a future agenda after those discussions occur, we could certainly do that. I mean, the conversation is important. I just, you know, um, if, if they vote tomorrow to dissolve, then problem solved. But, um, you know. They want, okay. I'm sorry. And for the T-BARTA members, um, I guess one of the concerns I have is the grants and the current planning projects that they're doing. What happens to that if T. Barta goes away? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Long. The two, the two transit agencies, it's my understanding, 
that the two transit agencies between Hillsboro Park and PSTA Pinellas are working with David to divide up that money because that money has to be spent on a project, on a project. And so, um, I mean, I have a lot to say about the issue, but I'm hesitant to do so just because it's, all of this is under discussion. But I do want to leave you with one thing to think about as we move forward on this subject matter. If you look at all of the entities around the United States that have ever been able to implement a truly effective public transportation system, they have one thing in common. They have one MPO. And those areas around the country, I'm just saying, you can laugh or make fun of whatever, but it's the absolute truth. And it is the best way to get funding because now you're talking strongly from a regional perspective. We have been unable, we had a whole big, David was there, remember when we went over to the port? I was there. You were there, guess who did not show up? Anyone from Hillsborough County. So my point being, there are conversations going on right now between Pasco, Pinellas, maybe Manatee, to go north and south and get done what we need in our county through Pasco and maybe over the bridge to Manatee. But that's another conversation equally as important as this one because as Commissioner Seal knows, because she was responsible for combining them, we probably would have to uncouple the planning piece from the rest of it. So. We've got a lot of big decisions to make on these two issues in the next few months, and having all of the facts in front of us is really important. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, unless it was added to one of the committees, that item is not on the board agenda to discuss the potential disillusion of T. Barta. Um, the things that are here is the US-19 RRT feasibility study, the area gondola feasibility study, um, public outreach and stakeholders, community services, employee outreach presentation, et cetera. So unless it's under a committee, which would be planning, that what you're just saying is not on the well, basic I, agenda. I don't know where he put it, but it okay. was part of our discussion that I had okay. with David so he may, they may add that to the agenda, but which is fine. You know, I'm just sharing that that wasn't on the agenda. I will tell you that the project that is cited for moving forward is the gondola project. I will also tell you that even when we had our um, retreat, which I agree with Commissioner Long, it, I don't know what that lady came to do, but she, it wasn't a retreat. <laughs> um, but um, being presented uh, with the specific things that T. Barter have been given the authority to do um, versus others was clear. And there are other things that T. Barter can do that others can't. Um, um, I think that other people who are leaving the agency, the one gentleman left, he went to the city of St. Pete, because when you consistently hear that your organization may be disbanded, you're not gonna wait around to the last minute to go find a job. You're gonna go looking. So every time we have this discussion, we have persons you know, who seek an opportunity if the opportunity becomes available for them. Um, I'm not even going to get into anything regarding Hillsborough County because that conversation gives me high blood pressure every time. Um, because, and I made my position very clear, if you're not going to work regionally, you should not even come or be to the table because it is very disruptive to those of us who are trying to put something together. And I strongly suggest it to all the board members that we look at projects that we could do that does not include them so that we can get something on the board because trying to do something and continue to have that same conversation, which Commissioner Long has had, you guys have had, it's the same conversation. So um, that's why we're just focusing on the gondola project and just trying to move that forward. Um, I don't know what'll come out. I, I've not talked, you know, can't talk because I serve on this. So I've not talked with anyone else about whether or not they will maintain their financial funding. All I can share with you is that being chair of the finance committee, I presented the report 
to uh, the other board members at the committee meeting of how T. Barter could continue to operate for one year through 2023 with the support of its partners. But after 2023, if there was no continued support um, or if we didn't have something magnanimous happen, that T. Barter wouldn't exist anymore. So, you know, I'm open to any ideas. I'm open to, to uh, any conversations, um, you know, holding off on making a decision about funding until we have this conversation tomorrow. I think it's a smart thing to do. Um, you know, we can't take any votes here, of course. You know, we're just communicating. And then, um, you know, we would have an update for you as of tomorrow by close of meeting. Um, there should be um, something definitive in the air about what T. Bart is going to do because the year, the end of this year is right around the corner. Um, but um, um, it, it's, it's just really sad because the organization has gone through a lot of ebbs and flows, ups and downs. And those of you that have served, you know, because you've been a part of it. Um, and it's sad that persons have been uh, on that committee who have no intention on partnering in a positive way. And it's really sad um, because I'm, I'm, thank you, Commissioner Long, for the history about how T. Barter was formed. Um, I just came on board, you know, of course, during the uh, Senator Brandy's um, strong statement about doing away with uh, T. Barter. And of course, the funding requests uh, made it all the way to the governor's desk. Um, uh, the chair of T. Barter has a good relationship, had a good, has a good relationship with Wilt Simpson and others, and that's how we were able to get both in the Senate version of a bill as well as the House version of a bill. Um, but um, there's a person that has also the governor's ear in the governor's office, and he vetoed it. So that's, you know, that happens. Uh, it's not T. Barter's fault on that. No one is saying it is. Um, but it's just very, it makes it more difficult when you don't have that designated funding source and you're dependent upon, you know, um, other counties or cities. And of course, they're looking at their budgets. Um, we all just saw in the paper where the referendum for the transportation piece was struck down by the judge because they didn't stick to the one subject rule and it was ambiguous at best. So, um, you know, I'm sure they're going to be trying to figure out how they're going to keep heart alive and all of those things. So. Um, but, um, and, and then the only other thing is CSX, as far as I'm concerned, is off the, off the table. I mean, CSX has been very clear that they have no intention on selling us their rail lines. And I don't see uh, any um, quality in leasing them because if they decide the lease is good for 15 years and then they decide they want to take those back, then we're going to lose those improvements we've done because you can't really jack up cement, take it somewhere else, you know. So um, those are the things that's on the agenda for tomorrow. And then, you know, if he, if they bring in this conversation, you know, uh, Commissioner Long and I can certainly let you know what happens as a result of that conversation. But um, I don't disagree with not making a decision today because if it's decided tomorrow, then not, not a decision. I'm sorry, sharing your your thoughts as it relates to continue to supporting the funding request. As it relates to um, Hillsborough and Tampa and, and the funding pieces, one of the things that was uh, talked about was persons at the table felt it was like double dipping because Tampa um, was getting, w received a request for a certain dollar amount and it was based on population. And then Hillsborough was uh, requested of a dollar amount but the conversation, which was genuine, is that these people all live in Hillsborough County, so it's double dipping. So we reduce the amounts, and I think I had that conversation with you guys. So we reduce the amount, the same with Pinellas County and St. Pete. St. Pete was paying a dollar amount, Pinellas County was paying a dollar amount. It was like double dipping, so it was subtraction of like 35,000 for one and 64,000 for the other. So it did reduce the amount. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers right in front of me. but. Um, so it essentially kind of took Tampa out of the financial equation because then it was only Hillsboro um, that we would have been making a request. Uh, so. And that shows up in our attachment. Um, the dollar amounts are in there. The dollar it's amounts in there. Okay. are in there. I wasn't sure if I said that to you guys or not. You I did. was trying to. You did. I was trying to get you as much as I could. Yeah. But so, yeah. 
I think a decision, to, uh, a suggestion today, uh, holding off on a suggestion today would be um, feasible since we're not sure what's going to happen tomorrow with the conversation. So, again, sorry, a historical perspective, and then I'll stop. But <laughs> when Bob Clifford was the head of T-BART, I actually talked to him about, you know, whether um, the MPOs could be underneath T-BARTA. And because, again, the powers that T-BARTA has, nobody... Scary. Huh? It's frightening. But that nobody else has those powers. So to be able to construct and operate a rail or something else like that, I'm not sure anybody else has the statutory powers to be able to do that, and unless it was, like I said earlier, HART or PSTA. But um, the final thing is, is going back to the merger business, um, I have my files on the merger business, and I think I pass them on to um, Whit Blanton with Ford Pinellas, but we talked merger very heavily in 2012, about 10 years ago, before the conversation at the Port Authority, and I thought I went um, at that time and visited non-MPO members in Hillsborough, Pasco, and I thought I had something underway, and that's where the TMA was born, because I couldn't right. couldn't make that yeah. happen because of resistance. But it, it just, you know, in kind of going through all of this, it just makes me really sad because, it's you know, sad. this is, we, it's, we don't have a border and a toll that says, here's Hillsborough, here's Pasco, here's whatever. You know, we travel back and forth for a lot of different reasons, and we've got to have a good transportation system. So I wish you all good luck in finally solving that. And then again, if Chris can find out I and send to us what we pay to, uh, I, I believe we pay quite a bit to the Regional Planning Council. He's going to send you that information later. It's wrapped up in I lots know. of other issues. So. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Long. Uh, well, I just wanted uh, to make a final comment because, uh, like all of you are, are familiar with and know, we all serve on a lot of different boards. So I ask you to just look around over in that public seating area, and guess who is not there? No one from T. Barta, not the executive director. And I hate to say it, but leadership starts with the top. And I look no further than the most recent incident about when the gondola project was presented at the city of Clearwater last week. Um, it wasn't the executive director making, it was the communications person. And at the end of it, the mayor was all excited about it because the gondola project has been being talked about for quite some time uh, back when uh, Doreen, not Doreen, Huh? Yeah, she was, and she was very positive about it. Well, long story short, the question came, what are the action items? What is the next step? And here was the answer. Whatever you want it to be, Mayor. So in all the years that we have now been working with our executive director, there has not been one time that there has been a recommendation from him who is supposed to be the transit guru, which is why we hired him, about which way should we go, what action should we take, what can we do. It wasn't him who brought those powers to the attention of the board, Commissioner Seal. It was Secretary Gwynn. And not in all of the time that he has been there has he ever addressed that, has it ever been discussed. So I say, you know, the leadership just isn't there, in my opinion, and we can delay this decision all day long, but as long as things are the way they are, I don't know how you make any changes and move forward. And nobody has been more supportive of t -Barta than I have from the time I was in the legislature until just recently when I said to myself, and we had a discussion, um, some transit people, you know, you, you can't keep on putting public money behind something that is just not working. How long do you do that before you say, we gotta do something else? 
And this is not new. We've been working on it for 50 years. Remember when Senator Sebesta was, the poor man devoted 100% of his time to trying to get this done. So. I just want to give the numbers. You asked for um, about, I guess, funding from the various sources for T-Barter. So 34% of the expenses um, come from federal grants for office lease, legal expenses, van pool subsidy, and planning subsidies. 31% of our expenses, and these are upcoming expenses, 31% of the expenses will be by state grant, commuter, ser commuter service activities, including the manager's salary, um, software, and van pool subsidies. And then 21% of it comes from the partners. 21% of the budget comes from the partners, the local contribution that's being asked for of the overall budget. You, you, someone had asked that question and I just found that in my finance reports. Commissioner Gerard. Just a question about where the grants are coming for. Which grants are coming from where? The, the corridor study to Wesley Chapel and the, um, uh, the, the US 19 study. Are those the two that are active right now? They're active, in, and it's a combination of FDOT money and federal grant money. So bo both of them? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, further questions, comments? Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not interested in, I feel, I feel like we have somebody on life support and you know, I'm, I don't think we ought to invest any more dollars here, uh, certainly not today or not in the direction today, and I'm not sure that this has ultimately been the, the tool to take us forward. There, obviously, in a region like we have, there's a, there's a definitive need for a planning role. Um, and so whether it's the MPO, the greater MPO, MPOAC, whether it's Tampa Bay Regional Planning, whether, whatever, there's a, re, there's a, a planning arm there, and we, that, that's, as you said, a day, another day for that discussion. Um, I, I, I don't think we do anything successfully, um, and, I, and I appreciate the effort of Pasco and Manatee, and if we don't have Hillsborough County at the table, and, and I know that's not easy. I try, I, I've been working on Tampa Bay water for you know nine to ten, eight, nine years, eight years now, and um, it has its challenges, and um, and the challenges seem to come a little bit more from you know Tampa <laughs> and Hillsboro, but there is true value, and I'm saying this, and true value in Tampa Bay water to the region. Um, so in spite of some of that pushback here and there, they ultimately get around to the idea that. We have real value here. There's, there's, and, and, and again, this has been 20 years that it's been in operation, so I'm not trying to draw comparisons. Um, but we have a couple of commissioners from Hillsborough County on there. We have somebody from the city of Tampa on there. I, I just think we've got to do that. Uh, we've been calling for several years now. Uh, some good reasons we haven't had joint meeting with Hillsborough County um, uh, commissioners. I know we had that one kind of festive get together, so to speak, but where we can talk about three or four issues um, and talk for an hour to two hours and just have a little bit of conversation um, in the room. I, I, again, I just think it's going to be it's going to be that important. I do think today more than maybe 10 years ago, Commissioner Seal, when you started the the effort to do a joint MPO, I think today there's probably more fertile ground for that discussion. I think the state certainly is pushing us in that direction. Um, I think there's certain members uh, in the area that would like to see something like that as well. Um, and, you know, Hillsborough County may just join kicking and screaming. Um, and I say that with respect. I mean, they, they just have, they're, they're just so internally focused sometimes. It's like the forest and the trees that there are greater things that we can work on that complement and supplement, if you will, supplement and complement the efforts that we're doing in, a, in our individual counties. So I, I guess um, that just a lot there to, 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 to really wrap our hands around, our arms around, but certainly I don't think we ought to be funding the organization anymore. Uh, but I do think the, the, the other conversation, there's, there's a lot of big conversations that we need to be having. We have, we created the, TM, the TMA, 
um, kind of as a as that kind of collective body. I think if we had a, an MPO, a regional MPO, that we would there would still be a reason to have representatives within Pinellas County that provide input to that group, um, to the representatives on that board. So I still think there's a way to, you know, more so today I'm thinking than there perhaps was before, where you can get the smaller cities input pulled together, whether it's planning, whether it's MPO, and give it to our regional folks um, to take to that big MPO, that regional MPO. I just think, you know, at this point, the conversation really is about the funding for, for, for T-BART, and I don't think we have a real sense of that for now, and certainly not supporting that either. But I do think we have some other big conversations, and they seem so fragmented. You know, we talked about our, our building department trying to break the silos, and it's like, well, we need to try to break the silos. You know, we talk water, we talk in transportation, we talk all these different areas that really, again, to be the great region, I think we have to have better. And I don't want to give up on Hillsborough because we have to, we have to have them at the table. But anyway, I know, I know. We'll just keep hitting our head. We keep our hitting our head. Well, Commissioner Long, question for Commissioner Eggers. Um, so I hear what you're saying. With that said, is it possible that we could start with the other partners and just? make it work and then by seeing that we have something that's really working maybe Hillsborough would come to the table what about that um well it, if we show them enough value i guess that would that might work um i mean you know it's a thought. I, I think i think there there's a, a commissioner or two that perhaps um might have a, a more global perspective than some of them. I'm just so surprised on that some of them have um, have just kind of not embraced the the regional um, the regional concept. I mean, it, it you know you can you can be the big dog in the room and still play well with others. And you know they're the largest county clearly. And sometimes they you know when you start to talk to others, that means you get less perhaps. And that's, I don't know what it is. But anyway, I, I still think there's, there's work to be done there. And I think we can, we can have that conversation. Uh, it doesn't keep us from having the other. I mean, I don't, I don't have any issues with talking to Pasco and Manatee. Um, but if we're going to be a successful MPO, and if, if the Fed, Fed money is really going to come here, and the state's really going to respect this region, like, I, you know, like it seems to be pushing us to a joint MPO, uh, Pasco, Hillsborough, I think we have to ultimately get there. And it just makes sense, you know. Um, I know, I know. Well, Com I'm sorry. Commissioner Seale, and then we're going to wrap this up. Just one final thought. Um, and it may have, I don't think it changed legislatively, but my, you know, going back again 10 years ago, the secretary of the District 7 had the ability to force a regional MPO. Had the, what? Had the ability to force a regional MPO. So uh, that might be a question that you might want to ask. Um, I know that we considered it that doing that, but again, if that's why the TMA was formed was because, you know, of the backlash. And so. Um, it's not really his style, but I mean, to no, force it, I mean, I, it's more about trying to bring it, you know. But, you know, I hear you. All right. So, uh, Mr. Minister, you've heard the comments. Um, I think we can, you, there'll be some, maybe some discussion and some uh, point in the wind of after tomorrow's meeting of, of what that, if they have a serious conversation about their future. You know, when Tibarta was formed, it was a great idea about these global projects and ideas and initiatives. Um, but it was never going to stand on simply the local contribution. The idea was that they would bring forth these initiatives, these ideas that were regional in nature that would be able to garner the support of the state legislature. The only way that was going to work was with the support of the state legislature and, and state funding. It just That's the only way some of these projects will ever happen, or federal funding. And so the state legislature has shown continually a willingness to fund to a certain degree, but then uh, has ended up on the veto desk. So. Uh, my thought is we have made a commitment to the organization to some degree. We should honor that commitment to whatever we can um, to provide. If, they, if there is an obvious glide path that they're going to terminate their existence, 
then we should be able to partner with them in helping that glide path so that we're not pulling the rug out. But on the other hand, we shouldn't be the only funders in the room either. Um, so hopefully tomorrow we'll have a little bit better direction um, from where they're coming from and then um, we can have some of this. But the conversation we should be having is our role in it, not necessarily solving, all, in my opinion, solving all of T. Barta's problems because um, <laughs> we, just, we just don't have that kind of time. Um, yeah. So yeah. further, yeah. further. Just, just State Road 60, I-275 interchange and the, and the monies that we fought for, starting with Pinellas MPO, it graduated to everybody in the region coming together. The state was looking for it. And we all finally came together with Hillsborough on board last, uh, but they did get on board because they ultimately saw some value and we did get that money. And when, we, when the economy went down, it was pushed back. The, when the economy came back, the governor came down and said, this is an important project. This is something we need to move forward. But the region had said it ahead of time. Together we said that was an, the most, one project, I remember the challenge, give us one project that you all can get behind. And we did, and we got it, and they didn't get it down south. And that's big money, um, and whether we're, we're going to be under construction nightmare here for the next, you know, five to ten years, but it was important money for us, and I think we came together. So there is maybe some little hope. I don't know. All right. Great. All right. Thank you. So we'll to be determined. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on to uh, the agenda briefing. I guess we can. Um, so we have um, in presentations awards, we have Veterans Day Proclamation, National Community Planning Month Proclamation, um, Employee Recognition Awards for Housing and Community Development, and for Public Works. Under partner uh, presentations, we have the Superintendent of Schools that will be here, as you requested, and he was happy to oblige. we got miscellaneous items. Item number 13 is the first um, item, which is under Human Services. This is an award of bid to Erickson and Lindstrom Construction. This is an expansion of the Bayside Clinic. You've previously approved most of the funding. is federal funding. However, as with all of our construction projects, there's a gap now of $319,000. And we have set aside facility funds for um, county facility renovations. And so the proposal is to take uh, the money out of there to close that funding gap. Item number 14 is a rank and affirms. Um, this is for uh, this is for the Center for Rational Living and for West Care, Gulf Coast, Florida, uh, for the adult drug um, court treatment program. You can see the breakdown in your packet. This is uh, uh, there's no overall increase in the budget for this next year. And these the, you can see the division of funds. Some of it's general fund, some of it's state funding. These are ongoing programs. Item number. Uh, 15 is an award of bid to MTM contractors. This is for Starkey Road Corridor Sidewalk from Almerton to East Bay Drive. County Attorney and Sheriff's Office um, things and then under the regular agenda, item number 19 is a third amendment to a contract. This is for planning support services uh, for CVB and this is, has to do with their strategic planning. So it's a third amendment to the contract to do phase two of their strategic planning. Item number 20 is a first amendment to community development block grant subaward land use restriction. Um, and this is for directions for living. Uh, and the first amendment increases the amount by $170,000 for additional cost of a roof replacement uh, from CDBG. Item 21 is a grant agreement with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Um, this is a forensic lab uh, grant that will be used by the medical examiner. Item 22 is an interlocal agreement with the Public Defender's Office uh, to support jail diversion, juvenile crossover grant management, therapy, information technology, um, and the mental health court. These are all items that were budgeted, and so we're incorporating uh, the expansions that we did with some of the IT things and um, public defender's office, along with the things that we have um, contracts for ongoing support. So a couple of them are new that were in the budget. Most of them are um, uh, continuance of past things we provide support for. Item 23 is a grant agreement, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. 
This is the for the vulnerability assessment phase two. As you recall, we brought to you a vulnerability phase one. Um, the under the Florida Resilient Florida Grant Program, uh, they're looking at conducting uh, phase two. This is seven hundred thousand dollars of grant funds for a multi-year grant program. Item twenty-four is an amendment number one to Fire Station nineteen. Uh, this is the Lemon Special Fire Protection District. Um, as you have seen, these are unanticipated costs uh, associated with their fire district, and so the cost um, is requested to increase from $3.6 million to $4.3 million. Um, the district requests additional from, from the county of $787,000. So the, we're seeing the cost increases. This is a shared amount. and. Uh, Item 25 is an award acceptance uh, for uh, COPS grant, uh, Community Policing Technology Program. This is $1.75 million, and this will be applied to the Consolidated Computer-Aided uh, Dispatch System. Item 26 is an extension of the Hazardous Material Response Terms Agreements with the following um, cities, Pinellas Park, Seminole, St. Petersburg, and Palm Harbor. Uh, they, this is uh, exercise the option to renew for four of the five existing agreements. And you can see the cost breakdown within the packet. Item 27 is a resolution and application to receive a medical, um, emergency medical services trust fund monies for pre-hospital uh, emergency services. And this, uh, for, this is for 2023, $146,000, and it provides hydraulic stretchers, stretcher mounts, stair chairs, accessories. Item number 28, it's advanced life support first responder agreements with 16 municipalities and independent fire districts. Um, and these incorporate the expansions that were that you approved as part of the budget and they're listed under specific ads. Other than that, then it's a continuation, um, but you're seeing some of the cost increases associated. Under item number 29, this is um, an update that I'm asking the board to uh, approve on Tuesday to the legal representation of multiple clients policy that the county attorney's office has. As you all know, this is something that we've had in place for uh, quite some time and relates really to the representation that um, we provide pursuant to the county charter for the county and the various constitutional officers. Um, there's really not many substantive changes to this policy, but I did ask staff to review it to make sure it remains consistent with current law. Um, what we really did was to try to make the, make the document more readable. <laughs> so those are really the, the majority of the changes that you'll see there. Um, so again, I'll be asking for you all to approve that on Tuesday, really just an update to the policy. Um, I also left at each of your uh, tables this morning a conflict letter, which is a new letter uh, under the old policy, since you haven't approved the new one yet, that we're going to ask you to approve. This is a con basically a conflict waiver that we are asking the board to approve, and the clerk has already approved. This relates to a recent lawsuit that has been filed by a sovereign citizen um, against the county, the clerk, and the sheriff. Uh, we, we provide litigation support to the clerk, not the sheriff, so we're asking the board to waive the conflict in regard to that. We don't see it as a serious conflict, otherwise we would just withdraw from representation. Uh, and for your reference, uh, Mr. Burke has already approved the conflict waiver in that instance. So again, the letter that you see at your desk, I will be asking you to vote on under county attorney reports on Tuesday. Happy to answer any questions. You can ask me here, or you can talk to me offline. Item 32 is appointments to the Greater Seminole Area Recreation District. You have two appointments. Um, item 33 is to approve two appointments to the local planning agency um, for reappointments for Commissioners Gerard and Eggers. Item 34 are appointments to the Tourist Development Board. You have four appointments. And County Commissioner New Business. In, uh, before we move on, on item 35 on new business, um, just an FYI, in a, at our last meeting, we appointed a, uh, we selected an applicant for service on the Pinellas Education Facilities Authority. Uh, it's come to our attention that that person that we approved has a, uh, 
conflict to serve because he has a dual office holder restriction. Um, so we'll need to reselect uh, that position. Um, the other two applicants were the current, uh, Noreen Hodges and Corey Gibbons were the other two applicants. And so we'll do a vote uh, Tuesday night for that selection. Okay. Um, okay. On to uh, public hearings. We have a lot. Um, <laughs> So um, the chair will get us. Do you remember? In, you remember how we minutes? got up at six oh five a couple weeks ago? Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's your goal. <laughs> um, so, uh, but you have a lot there that are pretty, you know, ministerial in nature. Um, item number uh, thirty six is from the city of Clearwater. It's a map amendment, office to retail, um, and uh, intends to use it as an existing bank and develop a car wash both Ford Pinellas and Planners Advisory each recommended unanimous approval. Item number 37 is a map amendment from residential very low, residential medium and recreation open space to residential low, medium and open space. Um, and so this, you've heard this before, this is the Innisbrook project and so it's 14 different separate parcels, uh, both Ford Pinellas and Planners Advisory um, recommended approval. This is tied to uh, items under the county commission later, so there's three separate. So when we get to that, I'll ask Tom to come up and explain how the three work together. Um, item 38 is countywide men, um, map amendment or plan amendment from residential medium to residential high, 4.3 acres in West Lelman. Um, you've got the intent of the applicants to construct additional multifamily dwelling units on the property and increase the density. Uh, it's consistent with the area and so Ford Pinellas and Planners Advisory both yet recommended unanimous approval. Did this one, was this one that we saw before and got pulled or did we approve it as a different authority? Yeah, Tom, yeah, Tom is the original map approval. Okay. Oh, okay. Did a map amendment second. Um, item 39 is a um, map amendment from residential low medium to office. Um, this is in the Crystal Beach area. Property is currently vacant, historically used as a parking area. Uh, the applicant doesn't have a specific use, um, but what's to amend it to where they can have flexibility with the property. Um, Planners Advisory and Fort Pinellas both recommended approval. Item 40 is another map amendment office to uh, public semi-public um, uh, property is currently vacant but used to be used as a nursing home it's demolished in 2006 um, it's currently next to the ymca uh, the amendment would provide for a public semi-public category which would allow the property owners to um, build a facility for social public and or educational services which is typical for ymca facilities Item 41 is a map amendment from residential low medium to activity center. This is in the sponge docks area and in their, in their community redevelopment special area. Uh, it's currently occupied by a single family dwelling and a historic structure. The proposed amendment is to incorporate the amendment area into the existing activity center and allow the use of the property for potential mixed use or short term lodging. under the Board of Commissioners. And so Tom, come on up and you can kind of explain the three items that go together, which is the first one. And again, this is Ennisbrook. So you've got a map amendment, you've got the ordinance for the future land use, and then you actually have the master plan um, um, approve, approval. Morning, Commissioner. And I didn't know Evan was gonna be here. He's the expert. So if you have additional question, he can. But the three items that you have is, Back on, on um, I believe, May 24th, you had the first public hearing. It was for the future lane use. We transmitted that to the state. We didn't receive any substantive comments. It's the second item here for the second public hearing. Once you approve the future lane use, the countywide plan has to be amended. And because of the size of the project, you have a third item that is for the development uh, agreement of the area that has to be amended to reflect those changes. So those are the three items that you're going to see that you're going to be taking action. 
Any questions? Questions on that? So are we microphone, please. Are we anticipating a large public? Go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> no, there are some internally, some of the residents have questions for from management related to other topics, but related to this project, there's very little opposition that I know. The, the main, um, <coughs> to, Tom's, to Tom's point, there were some discussions that we had, public showed up and asked about some management internal issues. Um, there was the issue of Clostermann Oaks and landscape buffering, where there were a few folks who came for that. The applicant has continued to work with that community, and in the development master plan, there is an updated uh, landscape buffer they believe is uh, acceptable to the community and everybody should be pretty good with as they continue to meet with them. So I don't expect uh, any uh, additional comments, uh, but of course we did mail out a big notice, so you never know uh, who will come in. <laughs> you never know. Thank you. Okay, so again, commissioners, that's item 3742. And then the development master agreement is item 43. Okay. Item 44 is a request for a change in zoning um, from residential plan development um, and preservation to facility-based recreation. And this is for the expansion of Rainieri Park. Item 45 is the ordinance. This is the second public hearing uh, for the ordinance ad adopting the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan to be known as Plan Pinellas. <coughs> Item 46 is a petition um, for, for request for vacation to increase the property size to resolve any encroachments in the right of way. Staff has no objections to the vacation. Item 47 is a 15 foot public utility easement, a petition to vacate. Um, vacation uh, would resolve existing encroachments into the easement and county staff has no objections to the request. And that's it. So 609, 611. You gotta set goals, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I can do my part, Mr. Administrator. <laughs> All right, Mr. Administrator, what else do you have for us this morning? So we have two, two other quick items, kind of ministerial items. You received an um, email from Commissioner Long uh, regarding the Florida Association of Counties Conference, um, a funding request. Um, so I'll, I'll, I won't speak for Commissioner Long. She can speak to that. Um, I did do some staff research on it, and I'd like to present that to you following, you know, her request. Well, um, <laughs> since FAC is having, if I may, Mr. Chair, since FAC is having their legislative conference in our county, uh, it's going to be at the Hilton starting on November 30th through December 2nd. I was approached by one of the staff people at uh, FAC to see if our county might agree to be a sponsor for the conference. And I said, well, I think we might. I'll, I can only ask and get back to you. So this is my ask and I hope you'll support it. And um, the rest is in your hands. I'd like to know sooner rather than later. It was suggested that I ought to wait until our next uh, commission meeting, but I didn't think that that was appropriate to do to fact since they are in a planning mode and have a lot of um, ideas and thoughts that they want to bring forward. So that's my ask. I'm sorry, 25,000. Mr. Administrator. So oh, sorry. Um, we contacted FAC staff and said, okay, how often has this been done? <laughs> What's our history here? Um, and so it's been done um, in two instances. Last year, I believe it was last year, when it was held in Miami, um, the, um, the Miami-Dade uh, Board of Commissioners provided $25,000. My, my understanding is because it was a very expensive conference to host there, and that was partly the reason for um, the donation. 
Um, the other instance that we can find is from Leon County when they have the lobby day and everybody comes up to there and they provide $10,000 on that. None of the other conferences, to my understanding, ha um, commissioners have provided a subsidy to underwrite the cost of the conference. So that's just the history I was able to provide, but it's really an issue for you and uh, so wait your direction. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the conference that we'll have here is a legislative conference, so setting, of course, the agenda. Many of us serve on different committees. The conference that was in um, in Broward or in Miami um, was kind of the pretext to what we'll be having here. Policy. Uh, on policy. And um, it, um, it included, uh, you know, tours of their port um, uh, and other economically developed components within Miami and what they were doing to showcase the city. Um, and so it covered those services. They utilized their public transportation, um, which was cool. We rode the bus everywhere we went. Um, so that was really nice. And it also covered because traveling in Miami was crazy. So they did provide police escorts so we could get to wherever it was we needed to go. Um, and plus going into certain areas, you needed to be able to have permission to get into those areas. So to have the police escort. So we're not asking for that. that Commissioner Long's not asking for that, um, just to um, to be able to um, co-sponsor the event here. It's pretty big for us too when you talk about a marketing perspective of all the different things that's going on here with our museums and um, things that we're building up in the community, movies that are being shot here, restaurants, et cetera. Um, so hopefully we, we will get support on that um, because it's it's pretty big, I think. And I would like to add that at the policy conference, there were over 300 attendees from all over the state. And so I envision that our legislative conference will be pretty big as well. And we want to be able to highlight our new Sunrunner Sun line, which, oh, by the way, the ribbon cutting is this afternoon. And um, so we're all really excited about that. And some of us have worked for years to bring that money down from the feds for us to be able to put that line in place. They have a few other grandiose things that we're planning on doing for that conference. And so I hope you'll all attend or make it an effort to attend part of it. But for people coming in from anywhere else, that's heads and beds. And as Commissioner Flowers said, you know, going to our restaurants and et cetera, et cetera. And just sharing, this is not anything I'm asking you all to pay, pay for, but I contacted Cragen because I really wanted to showcase also the Dr. Carter G. Woodson African American Museum, its proposed new location and what's going on along the 22nd Street corridor. And so Mayor Welch, his personal finances and me, my personal finances, we are hosting a meet and greet at the Dr. Carter G. Woodson African American um, Library. And then I spoke with Brad Miller about use of our wonderful public transportation. And he um, has agreed to allow the buses to transport the participants from the Hilton downtown to the museum and back. Um, so they'll get a chance to kind of meander through the community uh, as they go down. So just sharing that. So, and I'll be sending out more information. Hopefully you'll be able to, you know, make, make it and hang out and see the exhibits at the Carter G. And, enjoy yourself. But again, that is being paid personally between myself and uh, Mayor Welch. That is not being funded by the city of St. Pete or, you know, the county. Commissioner Seal. So my question is, if you, well, two, again, how much do we pay dues annually to VAC? I think it's a pretty large number. And then my second is, we supported a conference some years ago through the Visit St. Pete Clearwater at a much lower level. Um, but that would mean, that would be to me the funding source for this. But in comparison, we should be looking at how we um, fund other conferences when they come here and do a comparable investment if that's the case. I th personally think 25,000 is too much. So I'm sorry, but I, I feel like that's a huge amount of ask from our general fund. Commissioner Eggers. I think it's probably a little bit much as well, uh, but, I, but I do think um, there's value to it. So my question is, I, I heard 
Commissioner Flowers making some comments about getting, uh, maybe it was another conference where they got out to different parts of the community. And so um, if we don't have the time for that, is there a way that we could set aside time to kind of have the TDC put together a something about what goes on, what's going on here in, uh, in, in the Tampa Bay region, whether it's our airport, whether it's our, our port, whether it's our beaches, whether it's uh, the many, many uh, museums that we have here that bring that really is probably the number one tourism market, which is the state of Florida. Uh, so it would be a great way to kind of expose them to, without getting them in buses and getting them all over the county, cause, which takes a lot of time, maybe an opportunity to, to have an hour presentation made on the, on the goings on of, 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 of this mm -hmm. region. I, I certainly think, our county. I think that will be a possibility. The first day of the conference, they're offering the ethics training. <laughs> so some people what are training? coming. They're, the ethics training. Oh. That's the first day, um, and that's all that's going on that day. So there may be, you know, if this was offered, there could be some individuals coming in, you know, early for that as well. They're still, I, I spoke with, we spoke with Craig and, um, about what I wanted to do, and, and um they were still working together on the agenda. So if that's something that you desire, just please let me know so that we can talk with them and they can try to work that into, um, into their agenda. But it, it, I thought for me, it was very enlightening for me to see parts of South Florida that I would have never seen because when you go there, you go there for entertainment or vacation or whatever. But to see the, the backdrops of, of the transportation, to see how those huge cranes come in with the ships. You know, I even know now how we get our turkeys for Thanksgiving and what port <laughs> they come in. Um, I know that cars t typically aren't what the Port of Miami accepts. But because of what's going on, the Port of Miami is now accepting the vehicles from overseas and transporting vehicles overseas. See, I learned, I paid attention, you guys. Um, you know, learning about how they uh, shut down the tunnel to keep the water from flooding should there be a hurricane down that way. And then going to um, their arts warehouse, 10 blocks, um, just was phenomenal to see all of that land that was uh, dilapidated and and um, not well received and to see that all built up for an arts and small business community specific where they don't allow shops like Starbucks and brand name shops they don't allow those it has to be something that's local and that's community driven and is small business owned by someone so I don't think they would be averse to that we just have to ask yeah I I mean I, I'm a big supporter of fact 25 seems like a lot to me um, just to sponsor in general um, and, and not to come through some formal request from FAC to the county and with the sponsorship package, you know, what does that money get you? Are you sponsoring the welcome reception? Are you sponsoring the, the uh, welcome basket or packet of information that's in the hotel room that would have all our, our tourism? This, this, poly, this conference is typically you're in the hotel. Um, the Miami one, you're out and about in the community. So I don't know um, what part of this would be out to be able to showcase those things. I mean, you have arranged for reception. I think that's incredible. But I mean, I, I look at the policy, I guess there's some time in the Thursday afternoon that there might be some free time. But anyway, so maybe we can ask Barry to get with Ginger um, to see what that would entail as far as more of those kind of things. But if our TDC is not involved with the welcome packet or something like that, or maybe sponsoring the reception or at a, lot, a smaller amount, I'd be all, all, all for that. But um, to set the precedent of doing that, I don't know. That that's, seems a little uncomfortable to me, anyway. That's where I'm. I land. Anybody else? If she does call, it's probably better to call um, Cragen because Ginger will take the call, but she's going to refer okay. to Cragen, who's um, over putting the uh, conferences together, and she would, I think, have more information specific to answer your question. And Mr. Chair, quite frankly, Cragen will be more than happy to send a sponsorship package. We can pick and choose whatever we want. And to the uh, amount, Commissioner Seal, um, you did reference that when we did it years ago, and I would remind you that years ago, things were nowhere near as pricey as they are today. And so to me, that enters into it as well. And so 
And I and I, I and I get it, but I also think I that you. we need to look at what we do for comparable conferences. Correct. For visitors coming, um, I doubt if we invest twenty five thousand dollars when we bring another conference here. But I don't know, and that's a that's a question for Steve Hayes. And you know, that's the direction I think it should go in is through the TDC and you know make the ask. So, and, and look at what we do as comparable investments. And that's fine, but I wanted to have the conversation here before I put them through the exercise of sending the packet and everything and invoice or whatever they do. Okay. So, Based administrator will get together with. Well, yeah, I'll ask um, our team to get with them. And, and, you know, and I think some of the things you raised, I mean, we could, as you come through the doors, I'm sure CVB has a lot of marketing material to be able to showcase. Um, I don't think that's been requested, and so we can hook them up, but we can also look at the sponsorship issue, and uh, I'll, I'll let you know how that goes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are we on, are we on new business items? Not yet. Okay. The administrator has uh, one more thing, oh. I think. Okay. <laughs> I hate to even bring this up here, um, but I need to because <laughs> it, it kind of, uh, I, I think something kind of swirled out of, out, a little bit out of control in, in that, um, so it, it was a simple item to spruce up the bathrooms on the fifth floor. Okay, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Flowers requested. Lord Jesus. Yes. I, where my Tylenol? That's that's the reason. I, that's the reason I wanted to just r put this issue because what happened is Commissioner went out and we, her and I have talked about this. She, she said, "Let's spruce up the bathroom on the fifth floor." This is nothing more than what we do anywhere in the county when somebody requests. However. Um, our facilities, rather than coming to me, because we have seven commissioners, not one, they come up and they s looked at doing all kinds of things. And facilities looked at doing that, not, not us. And so, we, so they came back to me and I, and I got priced it. And so the question is, is we can clean it up like we do. We can paint, we can clean up the tile and things like that. We can replace tile paint. We could put in new, new countertops, you know, which, uh, there, it is. It's dated and stuff. But I want to know what you want. If we, if we, if, if we Can replace I, the two bathrooms, hang on, hang on. The one for the chamber. No, the bathroom. No, the bathroom. No, I, I went into the ladies' bathroom. This really <laughs> angers me because all of this gabbing, like people are in high school, and and elevating conversations to where they never happen that way is really disturbing to me. And this is the, the third time this has happened where I've asked for something so simple. So here's what happened. I went into the ladies' room to use the ladies' room. I noticed that there was like a little leak underneath the, the piping that goes uh, from the sink to the wall. And that the sealant that you use around the actual sink, you could literally like take the sink up and move it. And then the tile in there, the grout and everything, it just looked nasty. I said, I would be so disappointed to have a guest in my office and escort them to that bathroom because of what I saw. So I just asked, could mm -hmm. we replace the sink and fix the, the pipe thing? Because dripping water costs you money. And because the sink, you know, if it would have fallen through, it could have hurt somebody or whatever. That's all I asked for. I'd, all the stuff I've heard and the rumors I've heard and blowing out the walls and all this stuff, I never said that. So whoever put that out there, please go back and tell people you told an untruth. Mm -hmm. I'm, the Barry said he would uh, suggest that I chat with the chair. That's what Barry said to me. So I walked down to Charlie's office and I said, hey, I just asked if maybe we could do a little something, a little spruce up, because this is what I saw in the ladies' bathroom. Staff came up and two persons came up and they said, can you show us what you're talking about? By the time they came up, though, somebody had come into the ladies' bathroom and put new uh, court seal stuff around the sink, and there's a white sleeve, if you notice it, there's a white sleeve on the pipe now that goes underneath. And so I explained to them, I said, hey, I was just talking about fixing this because the cork was up, but it looks like they've done that, and to fix this because I see it's a, a metal piping, and typically people have been replacing that with PVC anyway. That's all I asked for. And so they said, well, we could just do a little bit of painting. I said, well, that's fine. They said, what color would you like? I don't care what you do. I just asked for it to be spruced up. And they said, well, let's look at the men's bathroom. Went into the men's bathroom. I'd never been in there until that day. And it was, 
<laughs> and it, it was small. And I said, they could, their grout could probably use some cleaning and some paint. That was it. So all of this other hoopla that has happened and occurred, somebody owes me an apology because I did not ask for walls to be blown out and all this elo eloquent, adequate spending money and all this stuff. That is all I asked for. And that was because I saw that the sink was loose and the undercarriage thing was leaking. That's how it came out. So there you have it. There you go. <laughs> you always have to be careful yeah. when you're a commissioner for... They want to please us to no end. And, and that's so, what happens. And I think that's what probably happened. I said, hey, I'm just. I know, but I mean. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, so, and that's, and, and unfortunately that is. But it wasn't is. staff who, it wasn't that staff that went out and started elevating this okay. conversation to <laughs> the ninth level. That's what happens when people think that they're telling something and they really are not because they don't know. And it's got to stop. It, it really does. I agree. So is it um, I, I think that they could do something with that floor. It looks nasty. I'm sorry. It just does not so, look clean. And the walls could be painted. That's all. That's all I, that's all I was asking because so, we all have visitors. And, and none of our bathrooms. And, and this is a routine item that would never um, require a conversation like this in any other floor. <laughs> you know? So, but, but because it was elevated, because there was chatter, you know, I just wanted to get clear direction. And I didn't want, you know, me to be saying, well, you're, you know, doing this and not getting approval of the commission. So if you want to spruce it up, paint, they can take tile, they can put new tile down and stuff. Those are routine items, okay? If you don't want, if you want us to clean the grout and paint, we can do that. You know, and I for just, the record, I offered to spend my own money and come in and do it. The two staff that was there that day, I offered to spend my own money and come in and do it. So if it will take out all of the yin-yang conversation, I will be more than happy to make that my community project. This is, no, no, this no. is, this is not, routine stuff. That. We have staff. We do this on a regular basis, daily, daily basis. So No, I, I think a, a power wash and a, a cleanup is fine. I, I think if after that there's other issues, we can address those uh, individually with the administrator. Um, this is great. Uh, Sorry to have sorry to bring this up but i just wanted to close this issue out no it, it yes okay that's all well, I, I appreciate have. you doing it because now hopefully those people that said things that were inappropriate will cease and stop i didn't say anything because i i was trying to keep the peace so i said i'll just let it work channels but it's got to stop at some point Elevating no, things. commissioner flowers communication with me was simply uh, inquiring about how we Make yeah. sure the facilities are maintained as far as safety and, and function. That's awesome. And that's a conversation we had. So uh, then it was turned over to the administrator. And um, yeah, so. That's all I got. That's all you got. Commissioner Long. We're on your new business. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that I'd like to offer congratulations to all of the 40 under 40 folks that received awards last night at their awards dinner. And just because we had a conversation about tr transportation today, uh, it took us two hours and 10 minutes to go from Seminole to the Armature Works. So for anybody, and this has been said at T. Barta, nobody goes from Hillsborough to Pinellas or Pinellas to Hillsborough. I can be attest that that is not a true statement. Uh, we already talked about the so uh, sponsorship issue, and then um, what else did I have here? Don't forget about the ribbon cutting this afternoon for the Sun Runner. It's a big deal. Only other thing I That's wanted to it. mention was, in case you hadn't seen it, it's starting to make its way around. I uh, wanted to note the passing of Gus Stavros this week. Um, uh, a huge contributor to the history and uh, success of Pinellas County. Uh, more will be coming out about his role in, uh, in his life. There's a service, public service, November 12th uh, at St. Paul's in Clearwater, 11 a.m. Yeah. Giant of a man. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.